Disney Deciphered, a podcast helping you save money, time, and stress as you plan your Disney vacation. On today's episode, we talk about my recent trip to Disney World, to visit the Christmas party, and to make up for all the lost trips in November. Find all episodes of this podcast at DisneyDeciphered.com, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere you find podcasts, and we'd really appreciate it if you could leave us a positive review. If you'd like to support the podcast, check us out on Patreon.com slash Disney Deciphered, where you can receive bonus content, or you can support the podcast at no cost to you by using me as your travel agent. Get started by emailing Joseph Chung at travelmation.net. If you have any questions for the podcast or topic ideas, email us, DisneyDeciphered at gmail.com, tweet at us at www.deciphered on Twitter, or find us on Facebook and Instagram, Disney Deciphered. Thanks, and enjoy the show. I am Joe from As the Joe Flies. And I'm Leslie from Trips with Tykes. And welcome back to Disney Deciphered. So it finally happened to everyone. One of us finally got to do our Disney vacation in November after lots of cancellations. And it was me. I went with my nine-year-old and seven-year-old to Disney World for a couple of days uh, after the Thanksgiving break. Um, So Leslie, you and I are going to switch seats for the day as we do a little trip report. But before that, Leslie, let's start by thanking patrons. Absolutely. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. If you're interested in supporting us and hearing some bonus content on our Patreon channel, then you can go to patreon.com slash Disney Deciphered, where you can subscribe at different tiers, as well as make a one-time donation. We'd love to have you as part of our community, and you'll get a special Facebook group that you'll get to be in for life, or as long as we keep it alive. Yes, as long as you're in for the life of the Facebook group. All right, so Leslie, I'm not sure how much of my live trip reports on the Patreon you caught, but I think you know mostly what happened on my trip. And I've broken it down to five C's, like a very well done Baptist sermon. So Leslie, why don't you take the hosting chairs for the day? All right. I listened to every moment of your trip report on our Patreon channel with rapt attention, Joe. Come on, give me some credit for once. I expect nothing less. I expect nothing less. <laughs> I'm glad to get some more detail about this trip. So so like you said, you took your two older children down. So this was sort of different than, I guess, some of your, your trips where, you know, you've been there for business or things like that. So tell us sort of how that shaped what you did and, and your plan for the trip. Yeah, I think the trickiest thing was having two different opinions. I mean, they are, you know, the kids were like, oh, we definitely, if we had brought the baby, I mean, the five-year-old baby, but if we had brought her, it would have been totally different. But they disagreed on like quite a few things. In fact, for example, because my son, the seven-year-old, wouldn't ride Flight of Passage or Expedition Everest, although I don't think my nine-year-old really wanted to ride that either, we ended up, for example, cutting Animal Kingdom altogether. It was stuff like that that uh, we had to deal with. And as you know, Leslie, there's a lot of negotiating. Like my son really didn't want to go on Slinky Dog. We, we, we found out this weird thing he has where he likes indoor roller coasters better, um, I guess, because he can't see the track or see where he's going. And so we were like negotiating that kind of the entire time. So like Seven Dwarfs Mine Train at night was better because it was dark. So we were dealing with this the whole entire trip, but it worked out mostly okay. That's really interesting because most kids are definitely ready for those outdoor coasters first. Like you say, you can see what's coming, but that's an interesting uh, angle to have to think about, you know, with your own kids because that never would have occurred to me. Yeah. It's a reminder for parents out there that one can never predict uh, what kids are going to like or not like, you know, even I mean, I know my kids pretty well, um, but that was a weird rule, I guess, that we learned about um, at the time that we didn't know before taking the trip. But after we figured out that rule, you know, once you get a feel for what your kids like and don't like, you know, obviously for myself and you, Leslie, we visit the parks enough that we know. But I think sometimes this is the advantage of having a longer trip because if this was our once in a lifetime or once every three years trip, being there for a long amount of time, you get to know your kids' uh, preferences and you can uh, adjust accordingly. So even on this short trip, we were able to do that, which worked out really well. That's great. All right. Well, let's talk about the second C, crowds and lines and Genie Plus and all of that. Tell us sort of how you navigated it, what it looked like on your trip, and whether you would call it a successful trip in the end. Crowds-wise, great success. I feel like I've always recommended this early December between Thanksgiving and Christmas 
time and Leslie did me a favor and I didn't want didn't want to stay up till midnight the first night of my trip so she helped me to buy Genie Plus on my account and I got a Facebook message in the morning being like you lucked out it's $15 and of course now that Genie Plus is variable pricing the lower the crowds are the cheaper it is and $15 is, is the lowest it goes and really these three days after Thanksgiving we were there Monday to Wednesday right after the Thanksgiving break was wonderful crowds Leslie, the crowds were so good that I am like debating whether to do this same exact trip, you know, just a short couple of days after Thanksgiving. It happened this year that I was willing to take off work just because we had to cancel all those other trips. But the crowds were really that good that I was like, maybe we'll go back because even the standby wait times. I mean, in fact, our first day. We didn't even buy Genie Plus. We got in, you know, mid-afternoon, a little later than that, actually, because we had some flight delays. And we didn't buy Genie Plus for Epcot. And um, I remember you were surprised, but we walked on to Soren at, like, 6.30 p.m. And it was posted at a 20-minute wait, so I knew it was going to be short regardless. So really great crowds. These shoulder periods, excellent for Disney crowds in general. Well, it's really good to see as things are starting to normalize that these periods are starting to emerge again, because for a long time, it really just felt like it was so unpredictable. And you, you know, go out of your way to to pick a time that you thought you were going to dodge some of it and it wouldn't be low. So it's good to sort of see these sweet spots reemerging. I mean, this has always been a sweet spot for me at Disneyland. We went a lot when my daughter was younger, like preschool age during that first week of December and had great experiences at Disneyland. Um, Of course, now that I have one almost entering high school, it's going to be a lot harder for us to take time off of school at this point. So so do it while you can, Joe. (laughs) Your kids are still young enough. You can pull them out of school and hopefully get out of school yourself. So, you know, that's, that's, that's good to see emerging. So, so how was the cheap $15 genie? You know, how, what were return times looking like? How were you able to work it with crowds that were so low? Yeah, it went pretty well. I had Genie Plus for the Tuesday. So our main like full day was Tuesday and we did Hollywood Studios and then we also went to Magic Kingdom that night for the Christmas party. And so I was able to get a couple of attractions on Genie Plus at Hollywood Studios. In fact, I lucked out and got Slinky Dog at some point. It like dropped later in the day and I just happened to be looking and it was like dumb luck that I managed to pick up Slinky Dog. But I also got Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, Alien Swirling Saucers, of course, Toy Story Mania. So I got four Genie Plus attractions done at Hollywood Studios. And then when we were done with Hollywood Studios, we went to the Contemporary to take a break and to watch. Well, it really, really went to the we went back to our hotel to um, watch the U.S. men's team play in the World Cup. But uh, while we were doing that, I managed to grab a couple of lightning lanes for the Magic Kingdom. Ended up not using it because we got stuck on the monorail on the way to the Christmas party. But up until 6 p.m. on Christmas or whatever party days at the Magic Kingdom, you can get lightning lanes. So I had two lightning lanes stacked for after 5 p.m. I think it was Splash Mountain, and I know for sure it was Peter Pan. And my goal was to roll in at around 5.15 and do both of those before the party started. But um, the monorail had other plans. But still, it just uh, even though I wasn't able to use all the landing lanes that I had booked, it was it would it would have been good value if you know that monorail hadn't broken down. And even only getting the four rides at Hollywood Studios, I thought was definitely worth the fifteen dollars for all of us. Yeah, those four, you know, pretty big headliners, I guess, bracketing alien swirling saucers. It's a headliner for say. you. It's a headliner for you, Joe. It's a yes, headliner for it you. Is, it is, it is. <laughs> that's that's a pretty solid purchase when, you know, fifteen dollars divided by four, you know, and, and then everything else is gravy. Uh that's great. Well, you I heard you mention uh the contemporary, so that's C number three. So tell us about uh your stay at the contemporary. This was your first time staying there, am I right? Yes, it was. And I think, Leslie, as things are normalizing, we can get back to our hotel reviews or hotel overview. So I'll save the majority of the content for a future episode. But I will say that I always thought that the contemporary, like the main reason why you stay there is the convenience to get to the Magic Kingdom. I already alluded to this monorail issue, which it was terrible. We got on the monorail at five, Leslie, and we did not get into the park until like six ten. It was a disaster there's no ifs ands or buts about it it was a disaster however we rode the monorail because we were riding the monorail for my son if we weren't doing that for him which uh 
yes, I will never let him hear the end of it for the rest of his life. But if we were not doing that for him, we definitely would have walked and we would have been into the Magic Kingdom at 515. I always thought that's the reason to stay at the Contemporary. And because of that, I didn't even think about what the hotel was going to be like or um, how I was going to enjoy it or whether I was going to like the theming. But I found that I really loved the Contemporary, maybe even more than um, we did the Boardwalk in February. Aside from the fact that it is super cool, both for seven-year-old boys and 42-year-old man boys that uh, there's a monorail going through the main building. I really liked the Incredibles touches. I think people don't like them, um, which I get. I don't like, I know why people don't want IP and everything, but at the same time, I thought the theming was very tastefully done, uh, understated, and yeah, just everything about the hotel really enjoyed it. And also got to check out the Garden Wing just wandered around a little bit you know there's the main building that you can stay in which the monorail goes through but then there's also the garden wing and the garden wing has its own advantages too it's like right there next to the pool um, which is super convenient the pool was nice so overall two thumbs up for the contemporary um, definitely my son talked it up enough when we got home uh, even though all three of us liked it that even my wife was like oh maybe i would like to try- stay in the contemporary sometime which uh, just gives me an excuse leslie to book it again in the future well, I'm jealous that you made it there before I did. I mean, it's unbelievable to me that I've never stayed at the Contemporary because, you know, my family, of course, we grew up going to Walt Disney World and it's probably the only, yes, yeah, certainly the only original or sort of not even original, like, but there during my childhood hotel that I have not stayed in. But one thing I do love about it, I mean, I've dined there a lot and, you know, you, you end up passing through it, like you say, because of the monorail a lot. And one thing I love about it, it's, it's one of the few places at Walt Disney World where I really get that nostalgia and that feel of history. I mean, I get it everywhere at Disneyland because that everything there is old. But um, there's so much new at Walt Disney World that sometimes you kind of miss out on that legacy of, of Walt and... And, you know, you feel that at the contemporary. So for those of you who are history geeks like I am, I think that's that's definitely a smart place to stay. And it's it's on my list. I will get there eventually. <laughs> I mean, that's a great point because I was going to say in that, yeah, you said exactly what I was going to say. We dined at Steakhouse 71 twice. We ate lunch there once and we got mobile order to go for breakfast once. And outside Steakhouse 71 in the hallway going in, there's a lot of pictures of the Florida project of like when they were building Walt Disney World and they even have, you know, Walt Disney um, checking out some of the grounds like the Swampland or whatever. And this was like the first time that I actually got to talk to my son. Of course, he was like super curious about all these old pictures and like pictures of the old monorail and stuff like that. And so I got to talk to him about some of the history behind like when Disney World was made. It was 1971, et cetera, et cetera. So like you said, there's just a lot of old history in that building. Got to teach my kids two vocabulary words, Leslie, as well. Contemporary and irony. So uh, education all around, <laughs> Leslie. Wow. I love it. You know, always teaching, Joe, even when you're taking off of time uh, from teaching. Indeed. Yeah. And last comment on the contemporary. Uh, my kids really enjoyed Steakhouse 71 and were like, we should go back there to eat um, next time we're in town. So still haven't been there for dinner, but both breakfast and lunch, two thumbs up for Steakhouse 71. Yeah, I really enjoyed that restaurant as well, even though I think that's probably the place where I got COVID last summer. (laughs) Oh, well. Um, But yeah, really great, really great food there and and great service. All right, well, let's turn to scene number four, the Christmas party. Um, Despite your debacle with the monorail, which made you arrive late to the party, how was the event? And hopefully it was only uphill from there. It was mostly uphill. Quick tip. The other thing that really hurt us arriving after 6 p.m. is mobile ordering shuts off at 6 p.m. And my kids were very hangry by the time we got off that monorail ride from you know where. So I had to wait a very long time um, to grab dinner for them at Cosmic Rays, of all places, to add insult to injury. Going back to our kids' independence at Disney World thing, um, I left them at their own table to sit outside while they were waiting for me in line. And I found out after I got their food, which took 25 minutes or something like that. So yeah, the start to the party was not good at all. But after the 25 minutes when I came to sit down, they were like, 
hey, you moved to a different line because we like, I guess they had like snuck into Cosmic Rays to like look for me together. They were like on a mission. So it was kind of cute to know that they took care of each other and that they made sure that I hadn't abandoned them like a terrible father. All that was not a great start. But after that, uh, the, I think the Christmas party was exactly what I had hoped it would be. And that was just enjoying the Magic Kingdom with my kids, with Christmas music playing and festivities. Um, we got to see the parade, which was really great. It was the first time my son has sat through a fireworks show. So I really loved that. We found a nice spot on the lawn because, you know, it's not super crowded during the party, even though there's, I don't know, there's still maybe 10,000 people there or something like that. But it's not as crowded as normal fireworks would be at Magic Kingdom. So we were able to find a space on the lawn that's usually reserved for fireworks parties and stuff like that. And, you know, he just watched sitting on my lap. I thought that was a great moment. I did say in the Patreon trip report that I loved Mickey and Minnie's Christmas party, but, and I don't understand why people hate on it. Well, Leslie, uh, you will be surprised or maybe not surprised, but I guess uh, my daughter is turning into a, a little bit of a, you know, theme park snob because she was like, they were okay. It's not like the other fireworks shows where there's a story to them you know it was just christmas music and the fireworks and i was both impressed and horrified that she would have feedback like that leslie put that girl on diz twitter right now joe i know yeah i gotta get her on the podcast so um you know she was very reasonable about it but she was like she's like even she's like enchantment and happily ever after harmonious they all have like they seem to have storylines to them but this was just christmas music and so i i I don't know. I, well, guess, I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> Blogger in the making. There you go. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and we actually ended up, my kids are not into characters anymore, which was both good and bad because there are so many cool characters at the Christmas party, ones that I would have loved to see, like Winnie the Pooh and friends um, wearing you know holiday gear. Aladdin was visiting with Apu, which was really cool. And there's just, um, and of course, Jack Skellington and Sally, which people love. Um, and so I would have loved to get those character interactions uh, and pictures, but my kids weren't into it. So we just use it as a chance to ride a lot of attractions. And we didn't wait longer than 15, 20 minutes at all. Um, and that was for Peter Pan and Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. And so we got a good seven or eight attractions, watched the parade, watched the fireworks, had some hot cocoa. Um, although the cookies are not great i would say you know those after hours parties where they give you popcorn much better than the cookies but overall a great success really enjoyed doing the christmas party with them and i was thinking about it and yes it's a premium like it starts at like 170 dollars or whatever but i still feel like it's something that you know if you're a disney fan either do the mickey's not so scary halloween party or do the christmas party at some point um on one of your visits because you know it's just it's nice to just have that after hours event uh, and you know the christmas theming is just a bonus on top of that it was really interesting just to sort of hear how your disney trips are evolving as your kids get older i mean this is something i'm obviously ahead of you on but it's it's so true you know what your kids enjoyed last year when they were character crazy and this year they're not into it and they just want to ride rides. It, it really does change your strategy. So it's something that folks who, you know, maybe are only going once a year or once every couple of years really need to be aware of. Um, Disney trips look very different at different stages in your kids' lives. So I, I, I miss the characters myself. Um, my son has, you know, just now kind of aged out of a lot of those. And I still enjoy seeing, like you say, those unique characters. And when he's not jumping up and down when we spot one, it makes me a little bit sad. But I'm glad we seized those those moments when we had the chance. Yeah, and this is where leaving the five-year-old at home really worked out for us because um, not just Christmas party-wise, but in general, like she was going to want to see all the princesses all the time. And, you know, not having to deal with that um, really helped with uh, the patience of my older kids. Now, obviously, if she had come, my wife would have come too, and we would have divided and conquered. But it's just kind of one of those things to bear in mind you know she's still on that character stage and so that's really you know it'll be interesting to see what things are like when we visit as a family of five in february um, just because of that for sure for sure all right well let's get to the final c uh cast members what do you have to say about your experiences with uh disney cast members on this trip yeah i wanted to add this on um just to get a fifth c um for you know proper outlines but uh i in general i sh had positive experiences with cast members all around. You know, I wouldn't say that 
I had any of those experiences. You know, sometimes cast members, they like really stand out and make you feel really special. I didn't have any of that, but the cast members in general were all very positive, had great interactions with all of them. No, nothing negative, nothing where, you know, I was like feeling like they didn't want to be there or, and I don't know, you know, maybe this is the Bob Iger effect, Leslie, that they're happy that they have a new boss. Uh, maybe it's not, but as always, Every time I go to Disney World, I just want to give a shout out to the cast members for all the great work that they do and for helping to make a positive experience for everybody. Yeah, totally agree. And I think you're probably right that the idea of there being sort of a new day and a new dawn does perk up everybody a little bit <laughs> because, yeah, there, there's there been a lot of negativity floating around and, you know, this is a second chance for Disney. So only makes sense that it would rub off on the people who are doing it day in, day out. Definitely. All right. Let me uh, close out with just a couple of points about just the writing that we got to do. I want to say that grabbed virtual queue for Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind from home at 7 a.m. You know, when I was still in Boston and I got like boarding group less than 10, like a very early boarding group. Like it was called before I even got to the airport. And, um, you know, it worked out fine. They don't care if you show up late um, for your boarding group. We ended up going at like 6 p.m. and it was like a 20 minute wait. So not too bad. And the kids actually really liked the queue. You know, that Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind queue is pretty interesting. A lot of fun things to see and videos playing with a lot of old school Epcot jokes. So not a bad queue to go through. So that worked out well. Genie Plus, as I said, worked well for Hollywood Studios. I still think like for early morning hours for that uh, extra half an hour that you get if you're an on-site, if you're an on-site guest, definitely Millennium's Falcon's Smuggler's Run still works really well for that attraction. Um, you can go, you know, we just walked on. And in fact, we got on so quickly and the way things worked out, it was just the three of us in the cockpit alone. So we didn't even share with anyone else. And we got a better score because of that because the uh, computer helped us fill out those other roles. Christmas party, I'm going to say it again. I would, I think either eat dinner beforehand and then just show up at like 6.30 or 7 or make sure you get into Magic Kingdom, you know, at 4 or 5 and do mobile order and eat dinner before because you really don't want to waste the party time waiting for food or anything like that. So just a reminder to go ahead and do that. Do not get stuck on the monorail like I did, you know, maintenance at three of the stops um, for the monorail that was in front of us. So that's something to bear in mind. And yeah, overall, uh, everything worked out great. We had a really great time and um, my kids really enjoyed it. And, you know, after all the waiting and canceling and all that stuff, um, it ended up uh, working out great. And so everyone was happy. Thank you everyone again for listening along and uh, bearing with all these stops and starts uh, as, uh, you know, out of our three trips, Leslie, we managed to get one in, the shortest one. Yeah. Wow. So hopefully um, <laughs> our track record for 2023 is uh, better. I can, I guess I can go ahead and announce that I'll be at Walt Disney World in mid-January, actually early to mid-January. So fingers crossed that that trip actually happens and I'll have um, lots to report. Yeah. I mean, January and February are going to be pretty busy for us because I'll be there in mid to late January, Leslie, for the Travelmation retreat. And then um, I'll be back in February with my family and then also going on the Disney Dream. And uh, as long as we've doing, been doing this, Leslie, you still haven't made it to Lunar New Year at Disneyland. So who knows if that ends up on the docket before, uh, you know, all is said and done. We shall see. We shall see. I, I think it's a long shot with uh, heading to Walt Disney World in January, but... I'll make it one of these days. And of course, I'll be back at Disneyland at some point. Even when there's not a trip on the calendar, things just happen to, you know, pop up. All right, Joe. Well, sounds like a great trip. Glad it finally happened. Why don't we close it out with our traditional Disney do or don't? All right. So I will start with a Disney don't. I'll do two since it was a trip report. And the Disney don't is Christmas party related, although you can apply the logic to any trip during the holiday season. Don't ride the Jingle Cruise, which is the Christmas theming of the Jungle Cruise, the holiday theming of the Jungle Cruise during the party. The standby line, it's going to be the longest queue all night. So don't ride that. Definitely ride it during the day. The theming is there all the time. So you can go at any time. You don't have to go during the Christmas party. Also, do still 
make that your first Genie Plus reservation at Magic Kingdom if you want to ride that because that's the one that goes the fastest. And my second Disney do, I guess this will be Christmas party related as well, is do ride Space Mountain with the holiday theming. You leave with a headache if you're my age, but my kids loved it so much. Um, You know, I think... (laughs) Ironically, Leslie, I think they are Space Mountain fans for the foreseeable future just because of that Christmas theming. They wanted to ride it again. We didn't get a chance, but they wanted to ride it again without the Christmas theming just because they enjoyed it so much. So do Space Mountain uh, with the holiday theming. It's a lot of fun. Great tips. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for listening, and thank you for following along. If you have any experience with the Christmas party or visiting Disney in the shoulder season, let us know DisneyDeciphered at gmail.com. Tweet us at www.deciphered on Twitter or find us on Facebook and Instagram, Disney Deciphered. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Other than that, Leslie, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, and I'll see you as we go head-to-head to figure out who's the next one who's going to get to go to a Disney park. Thanks, Joe.